All right, looks like we are live. And welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. And today we have an exciting and a very important program for everybody. I have S.J. Thomason here again with me, and we will be discussing evidence for the authorship of Isaiah. S.J., thank you so much for being here and giving us your time for this important show. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm really excited about this. So am I. It's a privilege. Uh, SJ, you were here uh, just over a month ago. We did a show on evidence for the resurrection. Uh, that show got a ton of great feedback and uh, very little in terms of actual rebuttals and challenges. So you did a fantastic job in that show. Anybody who's new to the channel, please check that out. That show is linked in the description box and it's also up on our website standingfortruthministries.com. Now, before we get right into the topic for this afternoon, I just wanted to remind anybody who may not yet be subscribed, if you enjoy debates, interviews, discussions, and more, then please hit that subscribe button and share around this content as the truth is important. If you appreciate what we are doing here on Standing for Truth, then please consider supporting us and keep, keeping us working full time. You could support us through our official website or through Patreon. Thank you, everybody. So SJ, before we get into the presentation, can you first uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what people can expect to find over at, uh, at your channel specifically, and then also why you find this specific topic so important? Oh, thank you. So I'm, my name is, as you know, S.J. Thomason. I'm from the United States. I'm a college professor. I teach business management. So I teach courses that don't completely relate to Christianity and the Bible and Jesus. But I came back to Christianity. I kind of flew away from Christianity for a while, but I was raised kind of like you as a Catholic, left the church, kind of waffled around there for a bunch of years, and then came back to Christianity probably pretty strongly in my early 40s when I started having a very significant spiritual experiences and what I felt were uh, visions and dreams and messages from God alerting me that Jesus is the true son of God. And, and because of that, it's just driven me to be so incredibly interested in the Bible and to want to understand more about our Lord and Savior. And one of the ways I came back was I was sitting on a plane next to a pastor and he struck up a conversation and he told me about C.S. Lewis's adult books, which I didn't know. I only knew about his Narnia books. And he told me about that. And so I thought, oh, cool. Yeah, I'll go take a look at that. So I read his book, Mere Christianity, after that. And Mere Christianity had the trilemma, which just completely, its scales just fell off my eyes when I read that. And so I started just reading as much C.S. Lewis as I could get my hands on, reading the Bible, reading other books. And then I got on the Internet encountered a bunch of atheists and realized that my arguments need to be much stronger. And so my channel is all about giving people as much equipment that they can, that as possible as I can come up with to show them the truth of Christianity. So I'm about sharing the truth of the message and of Jesus. And the other thing that pastor uh, alerted me to is Isaiah 53. And he said to me, he said, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Who am I describing? And I'm like, oh, come on. Where, where is that in the New Testament? <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm describing, so that's Jesus Christ. I mean, it's clear that's Jesus Christ. And he said, well, yeah. do you realize this was written around 700 years before he walked the earth? And I thought, oh my God, really? Are you serious? And so as, since I found out Isaiah, so I, I got off the plane. The other thing I did besides buy C.S. Lewis's books was I went online to see if it was in the Jewish scriptures. And sure enough, there it is right in the Jewish scriptures. And so I was shocked. I thought, oh my gosh, how can they get past this? And so today I thought we could take a little bit of time uh, also talking about Isaiah 53 and how it is not the nation of Israel, the reasons for it not being the nation, but instead being Jesus Christ, because he, you know, the third person singular was pierced for our first person, plural transgressions. Right. He took on our <laughs> sins. And so there's all these good reasons for that. But uh, but that's that's pretty much my story in a nutshell. And, and so that's what got me initially involved. But let me just say something else. One of the reasons that or one of the things I want to get into today is talking about the what they call higher critical theory or the critical scholars who starting around the 1700s in Germany started making claims that Isaiah could not possibly have been written when it has been historically 
claim that he was written in the 8th century before Christ. He started writing around 740 BC uh, when King Uzziah died, and that was reported in Isaiah 6. But it, they decided that there's no possible way that Isaiah could have could have possibly named King Cyrus the Persian, who took over from Babylon in 539 BC. There's no way that he could have named him specifically like that, because clearly that has divine implications. And so what they did is they decided to invent a theory that initially was called Deutero-Isaiah theory, where they split up the book of Isaiah and said that only a teeny portion, and now, now it's come to this part where just a tiny portion is attributed to Isaiah, and all of the rest of it is to the school of Isaiah, a bunch of anonymous people who never gave themselves any attributions, but tacked on books and books and books, or chapters, I should say, to Isaiah's book. And so, and they and they, they claim that these mysterious, unnamed authors did it over centuries. And so I've got a lot of evidence to go against that. So, I, but I will present their rather uh, flimsy evidence for that. <laughs> That's awesome, SJ. That's a great introduction. You and I have a very similar testimony. We've discussed that before. And um, this is such an important topic. I'm excited for it. And I love the way that you leave no stone unturned. You know, we are going to debunk the critics and we are going to debunk their so-called best arguments and talking points today. So this is exciting. Um, I do want to let everybody know in the chat, we've already got a great chat, great people. Good to see everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, make sure you're tagging me with uh, your questions. We'll have, uh, we'll make sure this is interactive as well. So, uh, SJ, why don't we uh, then kind of get right into it then? I know you had a uh, presentation planned for for us as well. We can. I do. I have. I'm just trying to see if I can share my screen here so you can see it. Uh, do you see the. Can you see yes. these slides? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm not great. doing all of these slides. I just I'm, I'm going to do some of these slides. But this is a so hopefully if you can see that. <laughs> looks great. It looks great. <laughs> so this is Isaiah. Isaiah, again, he was the son of Amos, A-M-O-Z, and he lived in the 8th century BC, like I mentioned before. And he started his ministry when he had a calling from God and he stood in front and he realized that God was asking him or calling on him to serve as his prophet. And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. And so he had a wife, he called her the prophetess, and he served, he, he worked very closely in the uh, area of Judah, which was uh, it, it, with which had the capital of Jerusalem, and Judah was part of what they call the two tribes of Judah. So Israel had two tribes of Judah. Uh, two tribes of Israel were in Judah, and there were ten tribes that were living north of them in what they called at that time Ephraim or Israel. And so he was in Judah, which is now again modern day Israel. And he, so he was living in a land that was populated by lots of mountains and trees and all kinds of interesting things. So the geography of Isaiah is pretty consistent, and I'll get into that in a minute. But he also he was under four kings: Uzzi Uzziah. Uh, he was under Ahaz, then he was under Hezekiah, and then Manasseh. And it's believed that the last one was quite evil and that Isaiah actually died after doing his prophecies and after his ministry, he died by being sawn in two. In, uh, he was put inside of some sort of a log, I guess, by Manasseh and then sawed in two. And so he had a pretty horrific uh, way out, but that's sort of how it works. But just to give you a few of his most important prophecies so you get an idea of who he was, he uh, explained his, his verses, explained Jesus' rule over the nations. And anytime you see the word nations in the Bible, it referred to in the Old Testament, it referred to nations other than Israel. And so he explained his rule over the nations um, other than Israel. So that would be the Gentile nations, plus, of course, Israel. His reign in the kingdom, that's Isaiah 2, 3 to 5. Righteous judgments, Isaiah 11, 3 to 5, 42, 1 and 4 and 66. He would be a light to the Gentiles who will worship him as in Isaiah 42, 6, 49, 6 to 7, and 52, 15, he would serve, he would suffer in extreme ways and would be rejected by his own people. And that's in Isaiah 49, 7, 56, and 52 through 53, 52, 13 to 15 through 53. And after his suffering, he would be exalted and would see the light, according to Isaiah 53, 1 to 12. Now, he would see the light. You have to notice that. In some translations, the English translations do not include the light. And that is because the light, it just says he would see. It's because the Masoretic interpretations of Isaiah 53, 11, which were composed about a thousand years after Jesus, 
Those somehow omitted the light, but others have been looking back to the Dead Sea Scrolls and realizing that's really important to include. It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so that's just a, an important inclusion because, of course, that hints to the resurrection. He would then restore Israel, according to Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, and will judge the wicked people who rebelled against him and will usher in a new peaceful, comforting Jerusalem. So through this book, we see that this fabric woven of Jesus and who he is. And you'll probably remember if you look at Isaiah 61 that Jesus got up himself in uh, the synagogue and read that passage and said, this today is today, I fulfilled this scripture. And so that's a pretty neat thing. And so he's just got some specifics on that. Of course, take a look at Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. You're gonna see very specific reasons for what who Jesus was and the references that the Lord laid on him, the iniquity of us, he shall bear their iniquities. He makes an intercession for the transgressors. So some Jewish people have made the argument that this is a reference to the nation of Israel because there are references in Isaiah to both a servant is either the nation or is this figure. But oh, the actually, I, SJ, I'm oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. No, I, I just oh. wanted to double check. Are, are you are you uh, meaning to? Uh, oh, I'm no noticing my slides aren't moving. Oh, shoot. OK, I can't see my <laughs> slides. Darn no it. worries. I, I just wanted to make sure that. But it looks like we're good. They're moving now. Okay. Okay. I don't know why my thing does that. Thank you for interrupting. I'm sorry. Yeah. No worries. No worries. <laughs> I want stuff. you to see these. <laughs> yeah. So, so this, so just to show you, so Isaiah, it's, it's, a. Uh, some people in Israel say that, or in uh, some Jewish people say that this Isaiah servant is referring to the nation of Israel, but it wouldn't make sense because it says he uh, would make intercession for the transgressors. And then, of course, Israel is referred to as people who were stubborn. They were being uh, they were being too prideful. They were not listening. They didn't have spiritual ears or eyes, according to Isaiah. It's mentioned in there, too. And so that particular servant could not be the same one who's making intercession. So we know that the one who's making intercession is a, a different party. And it makes most sense to have it be Jesus. <laughs> so that's the bottom line. And so the other thing that Isaiah prophecy, now this is what the atheist really gets uncomfortable about. So if you're an atheist, you, you might want to close your eyes and shut your ears and turn this off because you're not going to like this. But Isaiah prophecy, now you have to remember in the, Isaiah was living in the period of the Assyrian rule over the area. So the Assyrian empire, he was under that. And the Assyrian empire, they had control of, of everything all the way up until around 609 to 605 BC. So in that period, Babylon or Babylon destroyed Assyria in around 609 BC. And Isaiah prophesied that. He said that in Isaiah 14, 31 and 37. Okay. So he made prophecies very specific about how Babylon was going to destroy Assyria. And then he said, also, he made a prophecy that Babylon was also going to destroy the first temple. And that, of course, occurred in 586 BC. And that's in Isaiah 63. And he said, your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire. And all our pleasant places have become ruins, according to Isaiah 64. So Isaiah knew about that way ahead of time, too. Of course, as you know, so the second temple was destroyed in 58, or the first temple, I'm sorry, Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 BC. And it wasn't until King Cyrus allowed the Jewish people to go back and go back to Jerusalem, rebuild their temple. They weren't allowed to do that until around 539 BC. And of course, Isaiah knew that. Isaiah also named Cyrus. So Isaiah prophesied that not only was Babylon going to take over Assyria, but that the Medes and the Persians would be rising to power and would take over Babylon. And so he said that around Isaiah 13, Isaiah 40, 47, and 20. And he named King Cyrus in there. King Cyrus in 539 came to the kingdom, Cyrus of Persia. And of course, this was done with a dual kingship with Darius the Mede, as, as the prophet Daniel had pointed out. So we've got that kind of stuff coming in here. We also have Isaiah prophesying that the Jews would return from exile. He knew they'd go into exile. They were going to return and rebuild their temple. And again, that started after King Cyrus, so right around 536, 537 BC. Um, and that's mentioned in Isaiah 27, 14, and 6. And here's a quote from Isaiah 45. I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. So this 
This makes the atheist very uncomfortable. And so here's what Ulrich Burgess, now he is a, a scholar. This is a person who's on the, the atheist, I don't know if he's an atheist, but he's definitely in the, the camp of critical scholarship. And so he explained how people came about in the 1800s and 1700s, how they came about to make the Isaiah prophecies suddenly now put Isaiah into the time when he prophesied. It would make sense to call him a prophet Isaiah, though, if he hadn't prophesied. So here's what Here's what Ulrich Burgess says. The historical gap of more than 150 years, which lies between Isaiah at the end of the 8th century and the time of the end of the exilic period, presumed in Isaiah 40 to 55, Cyrus's decree in 539 BC, could, with the rise of the historical critical Bible interpretation, no longer be overcome by merely referring to the visionary power of Isaiah. To compound matters, Isaiah is said not only to have announced the prospect of salvation, but also to have mentioned the name of the new Persian ruler, Cyrus II, in Isaiah 44, 28 and 45, 1. It was this problem which gave rise towards the end of the 18th century to the argument between ecclesiastical and rationalistic interpretation. This argument was not only concerned with the question as to which words can be traced back to Isaiah, but more fundamentally with the question as to what rationally comprehensible accreditation one was prepared to give to the prophets and what not. This is of utmost importance to the emergence of the Deutero-Isaiah hypothesis. And so this is in Old Testament essays. And here's another scholar named Patterson who said something rather similarly. He said, the majority of these critics start out with the assumption that there is no such thing as predictive prophecy. And therefore, as the so-called Isaiah speaks of the delivery under Cyrus, he must have lived at the date himself. When we understand that the spirit which underlies this kind of criticism is a disbelief in the doctrine of inspiration, we do not give much weight to the logical deductions from such a premise. So they're starting with this idea that it's impossible to have fulfilled prophecies. And so what they've come up with is that there, there's a Isaiah likely, first they started off saying Isaiah just did, there were three sections of Isaiah was, was one initial idea. First there were two, one to 39 and 40 to, 50, to 66. Then suddenly people said, well, no, maybe he just wrote the first 39 chapters and the stuff that came in with King Cyrus must have been written during the time of King Cyrus, which was the stuff 40 and on. Then they realized, oh, oh, wait a second. Ooh, there's stuff in 1 to 39 that also does references to Babylon and the exile and that sort of thing. So they realized, well, now they, a lot of them are starting to say that maybe the whole thing has just been authored by a bunch of people after Isaiah, this mysterious school. And so here's some reasons to reject OK, I call it greater reasons to reject because it's the acronyms. So the first one is geographic reliability. The people who think that Isaiah was written, uh, portions of Isaiah were written much later, like they'll say that he wrote during the time of King Cyrus. He wrote from the perspective of somebody living in Babylon. That is uh, that's what some of them say. Some say he even wrote after that living in Persia. OK, but the problem with that idea is there's references through the book. There's geographic reliability in the trees, the mountains, the etrogs. Uh, in other words, I'm going to get into that in just a second. But to show you that the trees that he mentions many times are specific to the area in which he lived in Judah. Uh, the fact that there's mountains there, because in, in Babylon, it's very flat. He references the word here, referring to Judah and Jerusalem and Zion quite frequently. And he refers to Babylon as there. Uh, so that was, again, not referencing this and uh, not making it clear that it could be something else. There's also early attestation. So scriptural labels of a prophet by Jeremiah. OK, so Jeremiah called Isaiah a prophet in 2 Kings 20, 8 to 11. The author of 2 Chronicles 32 also named Isaiah as a prophet, meaning that he had to have fulfilled some prophecies. In the book of John, Jesus gave credit to the prophet Isaiah for different passages that are included in multiple parts. Luke, that, so in Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 53, Luke in Acts 8, 26 to 38 also referenced Isaiah and spoke, of course, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and identified that as Jesus. Uh, Matthew 3, 3, Paul in Romans 10 also attribute the books in Isaiah to Isaiah. So nobody's saying it's to somebody else. We also have Ben Sirah in Sirach 40, 20 to 22, Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews and Against Appian, the Qumran, 
Okay, so the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Damascus document all again make attributions to Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos for the, the chapters in the book of Isaiah. Nobody else is ever named in ancient times. Zero. Absolutely no one else is ever given credit for those books. Uh, they also have Testament equivalents. So what's cool about the book of Isaiah is when they created chapters, they created 66 chapters and those spread out just like the Bible. So the first 39 chapters kind of have to do with the hammering process, the justice and punishment idea. So people are being punished for adhering to the nations rather than God, trusting in nations rather than God. And then we start with comfort, comfort at chapter 40. And that's similar to the 27 books of the New Testament, the idea of comfort, righteousness, redemption, and hope. So it follows very similarly to how the Bible itself is written. And then, of course, there's reverence. There's phrases throughout the book of Isaiah to the Holy One of Israel, 31 times in the whole Bible that's mentioned, and 26 of those times are in Israel. So those are the big arguments. And so that's what I wanted to get to to show you for now. So, <laughs> so that's, we can go back to, we can go back here. Yes, uh, there we go. Uh, great slides, great presentation there, SJ. Isn't it amazing that due to the, um, these astounding, fulfilled supernatural predictions of Isaiah, the critics of the Bible and those that want to reject God are forced to do pretty well whatever they can to reject the evidence and, and put forth this um, kind of wild theory. Um, so I guess my, my question would be, SJ, um, these critics, what are their favorite or strongest arguments for this multiple author theory um, that they're putting forth in order to reject these uh, fulfilled predictions of Isaiah? So their good question. Their number one argument is that prophecies cannot occur. We have to find a naturalistic explanation for the named King Cyrus. <laughs> that's the number one. <laughs> but that's not something that a Christian has to, has to follow. So then they have two other pieces of uh, what they consider strong arguments, which I would say they're not. But one of them is what they call the Le Leviticus Rabbi. So 6.6 6 and 15.2, uh, Rabbi Simon attributed the passages in Isaiah 8, 19 to 20. So these two little teeny passages to a prophet named Beery. And Beery's prophecies weren't enough for a book of his own. So Rabbi Simon said that they added them to Isaiah's. However, note that this was written 1300 years after Isaiah. Okay, so it was written around 500 AD. So again, nothing in ancient times, nothing before Christ. And then the second thing that they have is they'll look at the Isaiah scroll, the great Isaiah scroll discovered at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they notice that people put these little breaks, like these little squiggly lines, in a few places uh, between, say, 36, 1, 40, 1, 42, 13, 45, 1, 52, 7, and 61. So there's these little squiggly, kind of like half moon marks. So some people said, aha, that must mean that Isaiah was spreading out those, you know, designating these as different areas. But we have to remember, they didn't have chapters back in those days when they created the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if a scribe created his own sort of divisions, that can make a lot of sense. And if, if you look at those divisions, what they're speaking to is just different ways of looking at God. So references to like, for example, one of them says the, the it says in Isaiah 39, 8, then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good for he thought there will be peace and security in my days. And then the next line is comfort, comfort my people, says your God. So it's a division between the Lord being good, the word of the Lord is good, and then the Lord is a comforter. And so that's those are the two big arguments. And so I'd say they're pretty flimsy given all the ancient evidence we have against that. Yeah, absolutely. It it really reveals just how anti-supernatural these critics are. And as you've pointed out, one of these amazing predictions is the fact that Isaiah predicts Cyrus mm -hmm. uh, over 200 years in advance by name. And, you know, the critics, I, I've read that, you know, one of their arguments, it seems like circular reasoning to me. I wonder if you can expand on this. They reject the supernatural. They reject the fact that the Bible is inspired by God, right? Holy men spake as they're moved by the Holy Ghost. So therefore, in their minds, you know, these can't actually be fulfilled supernatural predictions. So there must be some other explanation. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is where the criticisms and challenges come into play. Isn't this circular reasoning? And, and what are your thoughts on this, SJ? Yeah, no, I definitely think it's circular reasoning. And it's 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 sad because if they would just grant the fact that God can can influence people as he's did, they would probably realize that their eyes themselves would be open. But I think so many of them don't want to have their eyes opened. And I, I can say there's the the beauty of the book of Isaiah is something quite quite amazing because like for example when i was just mentioning the trees and talking about a little bit of the beauty is right. isaiah himself he the, the way that the book's written it's got a lot of poetry in it and it's got really cool references like in the beginning of the book it starts talking about how the trees are going to be chopped down and the whole first 39 chapters talks about woe is you know woe is israel woe is ephraim woe, woe is babylon all of these these places are going to go down and then suddenly you get to the later books. And so the trees are getting chopped down. There's lots of symbolism. And then in the later books, we start seeing this sprout coming up. And even in Isaiah 11, first it's mentioned from the stump of Jesse. So the trees are chopped down and out of those chopped down trees, out comes this root, this root blossoms. And then as we go into the servant songs, we can see that the blossom fruit in blossom comes out to Jesus. And so Jesus, again, in Isaiah 53, we've got the stump coming out. And then if you go to the very end of Isaiah, it's very similar to the book of Revelation, kind of like the end of the Bible, because the end of Isaiah speaks about the deliverance, the coming deliverance, and about the end times, and about the hope that we have. And so the book is a full, beautiful story of redemption, and it's written in such a poetic way that to try to slice it all up and say that all of these different authors added to it seems rather, seems it, it just seems unreasonable given the amount of information and the co consistency and the coherence of the whole message. Great response, SJ. Great response. I've got um, some good questions here. Like this one comes in from Praise I Am. Thank you for your question, Praise. He asked, does SJ believe Isaiah 714 is written 700 to 800 BC or more modern? Yeah, I definitely believe it's written when Isaiah wrote it. So Isaiah started writing around 740, and most people think he ended his writing right around probably 700. So he wrote over a, period, a long period of years. But the Isaiah... Seven chapter seven through chapter twelve are called the Emmanuel chapters, and it's because of the reference to Emmanuel. Uh, mm -hmm. For to us a son is born, to us a child is given, and uh, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty Father, Everlasting Father. I'm sorry, and uh, and Prince of Peace. And so, so we've got, and we've also got for to us, um, the Lord will give us a sign. A virgin will give birth. And so the idea is in the book of Matthew, Matthew referenced that as, of course, Mother Mary, the virgin birth and the birth of Jesus. And if you look at all of those chapters, chapter seven through 12, you realize you have to look at the entire picture. So part of that passage in chapter seven was fulfilled in King Ahaz and the birth of his own son, Hezekiah, who ended up becoming a king. And he was a good king for a bunch of years. But then Hezekiah failed and he unfortunately became very prideful and he ended up uh, in his way, his kingdom ended up eventually being turned over to Babylon because he trusted in Babylon and trusted those nations rather than trusting in the Lord. And so he is not the same person spoken of in Isaiah 9, 6. So 7, 14 and 9, 6 go hand in hand. Uh, again, 7, 14 talks of the virgin birth and Isaiah 9, 6 talks of the wonderful counselor for to us, a child is born. And so you hear that a lot at Christmas time. But the reason why the chapter 714 cannot be uh, cannot be just something that's attributed to only in Isaiah's time is because you have to look at the full passage and realize that there's a righteous servant coming up in there. I hope that made sense. <laughs> Absolutely. And praise says great answer. Uh, great response, SJ. As always, you've clearly been doing a lot of study on this important topic. And as you said, you know, it's it's Christmas time. It's Christmas season. So this is the imp uh, a very important topic. Uh, to me, the, this should uh, automatically result in the atheist conversion. I mean, it's just it's it's amazing evidence. And as you're pointing out, you know, their their best so-called objections are just so easily uh, demolished. Logical, plausible, probable says uh, SJ always doing awesome presentations. Amen. Um, but is she trying to trigger Kip in the gang? <laughs> Dang it. How did he know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that obvious? <laughs> he, yeah, that, hey, hey, that LPP, he catches on quick. Um, that's funny. 
<laughs> now, great. you dealing with a lot of these critics, and I, and I know we've covered their, their so-called best objections. At, the, at this point, with what you've presented, SJ, you know, what would they, even the most militant critics, your PhDs, I guess, in, in some of these related topics, how, how would they respond? We know that they wouldn't just tap out. So how, how would they respond at this point, in your opinion? Well, I think I think you have to look at you look at a bunch of the passages in there. And like the one I just mentioned with Isaiah 714, the critic is going to say, well, the original word that's used in there referred to a maiden, a young maiden. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to say that the, the, the word is Alma, A-L-M-A-H. And so so one of the arguments against that is to say that that uh, it wasn't anything special, even though it says the Lord is going to show a sign that a virgin is going to give birth, or even if it's a young maiden is going to give birth, a young woman living at the time of Israel would have been a virgin if she followed the rules. Because if you weren't a virgin, you're pretty much killed. And so, so that's it. I mean, you weren't a virgin before you got married. And so, so that's the argument there. They'll say, well, it's just a young maiden and it's fulfilled in Ahaz's time. But if you look at the context of the whole passage, you realize it actually has to be referring to the same one as Isaiah 9, 6. And so it has to be something beyond just uh, Ahaz's son, Hezekiah. So, but the, but the other pet thing that they'll do is it's the big one that the atheist is going to come up with is they'll place just a lot of emphasis like Kip, who, whom uh, J uh, John is referring to. Kip is a Dead Sea Scroll expert. And so Kip is going to immediately say that those little squiggly lines that are in uh, this great Isaiah scroll that are dividing up, that must mean multiple authorship. But do you think that that if you see a line between a different, you know, just a squiggly line in some versions of the Isaiah scrolls, which is a bunch of Dead Sea Isaiah scrolls, but this in the great Isaiah scroll, you see a couple of divisions. Does that to you suggest necessarily that this is different authorship? Or could you say that there's just somebody saying maybe there's a difference in, in particular messages being uh, composed? All right, great response, SJ. Here's um, one I'll, I'll share screen. This is a, <clears throat> so right here. Um, when these critics point out, and let's say they were to, like in, in a debate, what would be a good quick response uh, for when they say that there are differences in theme and language bef between, you know, quote unquote, first and second Isaiah? Uh, there, yeah, go ahead. That's that's good. So that's uh, that's what they, that is one of the things that some of them will say. And so first Isaiah is what they also call proto Isaiah, and that's wow. the first thirty nine books. Second Isaiah is the books forty to fifty six. I'm sorry, they break them up in two ways. Sometimes it's second and even third Isaiah. So it's forty to fifty five, and then fifty six to sixty six. But the difference is, is that in the first thirty nine books, the and and actually I have seen. I've got another book I would re refer to you from Gleason Archer. Gleason Archer mm. has looked at the ancient language of Isaiah, and he's noted that it's remarkably consistent with how it's all put together. Um, but because he's an expert in that sort of thing, Dr. Gleason Archer. But the thing is, is in the first 39 books, it's about one sort of message. It's just like the Old Testament. So it's the first 39 books of our Bible. The Old Testament talks about the idea of justice and redemption and how people need to follow God and to trust in God. And then the last 27 books, and this is the continuation, this is the fulfillment of the first 39 books, where suddenly we see the, the, the vicarious redemption of Jesus Christ and, and the light and the light to right. all nations and, and all that kind of stuff. And so I'd say the message is consistent. Um, the poet, poetic language is consistent. References to Holy One of Israel woven throughout. There's a lot of poetry that is woven throughout. Um, there's, let me just also just mention with the trees, I'm just going to go back to the trees for just a second here, because the, in the trees, actually, you want to, can you show my slides again? Absolutely. There you are. You. So this just gives you a feeling for, here's the time of Isaiah. So this is, these maps are both freely available on the internet. I didn't take, I didn't take something that's copyright. <laughs> so, so these maps are just showing you during the time of Isaiah. And this is of course, during the time of instead the Neo-Babylonian empire and the Persian empire. So you can see these times that came after, but this is around 540 BC for the second one, when they're posing that Isaiah, uh, the Isaiah school wrote Isaiah. And then there's where Isaiah was living. Now, the thing is in the trees that Isaiah mentions, you're going to see that he says things like the trees are proud and lofty. Uh, so the Lord cut off from Israel head and tail, palm branch. The references to the trees in first Isaiah are very consistent with what you'd see in Israel. And second Isaiah, you can see more messages on cutting down the trees. It's a continuation. Uh, he grew up like a young plant. We see that uh, the thorn shall come up instead of the cypress. 
um, shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. So you can see in the first one, we have a progression of the trees. We start off with them being cut down and burned. And then suddenly in the second Isaiah, they start uh, like a root out of dry ground. You see that in Isaiah 53. Third Isaiah, we've got more references to trees and we've got specific names, the cypress, the plain, the pine. And so these are references to trees that are very consistent with ancient ancient Judah. And so here's the other references. Nehemiah noted that the, oh, the other really big one is the, um, and so the reason I'm bringing this up is because I believe that we see a lot of consistency in the messages across the whole book of Isaiah. And so another consistent thing that we see is there's a festival called the Festival of the Tabernacles. And in the Festival of the Tabernacles, which Jewish people celebrate in the fall, they celebrate the uh, Moses and the coming into the, the land of Canaan and that sort of thing in the land of milk and honey. And they celebrate it with four different species of plant. And one of them is called the etrog or the citron. And the citron is never mentioned in Isaiah, even though the citron has been found evidence of it between the sixth and fifth millennia. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Around the fifth century BC, citron, uh, they found citron evidence in Israel, but it had been brought to Israel from India around there. So the fact that Isaiah does not name the citron, even though it's such a very important part of the festival of the tabernacles, but he does name the other three species, that, that also suggests something. And those other three species are, of course, the palm, the myrtle, and the, um, the cypress. So that's that <laughs> I'm mentioning in this one. I've got, I've got in this one right here. I just have what also was interesting is because Nehemiah it, writing around the fifth century BC, Nehemiah at that time, the other uh, species that they were using in place of the citron was the olive. They didn't have a citron then. And so I'm just trying to name this because dating Isaiah pretty far away and not including that would be important when that particular plant was not around. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm loving the slides. I love the visuals, the arguments. And I, I've read that, um, you know, that this isn't really an argument for, for a couple of reasons, too. And I'm curious as to your thoughts is that the language for one in the first half of Isaiah is mostly judgment, mm -hmm. while the second half is comfort. And would you hold to the position that Isaiah may have wrote these chapters towards the end of his life. Therefore, like a, a younger Isaiah would, would possibly write slightly different than an older Isaiah, which, which could explain some of the, the, the different maybe tones or language. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, SJ? I, I think that's a great argument. And it was funny because David Falk just made a similar argument on my channel because he was talking about how I asked him about the language of Moses and how the five books of the Pentateuch, how they could have differed slightly. And he said, it's because Moses was written over 40 years. And he mm. said, it's kind of like the language that we can see coming from Queen Elizabeth that's been documented, how differently she spoke when she was, say, 25 than how she speaks now. She used to apparently speak in a much more formal way, but now she speaks much more colloquial colloquially. And so there's there's that with her. But then we can even think of our own language. Like I look at my own writing from 25 years ago, and it's quite a bit different than my writing today. And I emphasize different words. And the English language has changed. Words that we use today were never used back then. And so, and words have changed in definition over the last 25, 30, 40 years. And so if Isaiah's written over a 40 year period, which we think it was, we should expect it would be slightly different towards the end than it would be in the beginning. Amen. Exactly right. Exactly right. I, I love this because it, it's such amazing evidence directly from the Bible, you know, this uh, supernatural fulfilled prediction and uh, predictions, I should say. And really all of their arguments to to reject, you know, the clear testimony and evidence of this really just comes down to what I believe are um, rescue devices. And SJ, as you pointed out earlier, and I'm curious as to your thoughts of this. Isaiah even, even predicts uh, Jesus Christ, his person, his work, several mm -hmm. hundred years in advance. So even if for sake of argument, you know, this, um, we assume that this critical dating of, of Isaiah is correct. Does, would that even help them in the case of, of those specific prophecies of, of Jesus Christ himself? No, that would, but that wouldn't. But you know what they do with those prophecies is they'll go and this is what the the atheist scholar will do. They'll say, well, the New Testament authors had access 
to mm -hmm. Isaiah. And so they wrote the whole story based on fulfillment of the prophecy. And so that's the claim against that. So, but, so that one doesn't bug them as much because that's what they claim, which okay. is kind of sad. Okay, so they're but, saying that the New Testament writers had access to Isaiah. So they are just writing the life, work, and person of Jesus according to these, uh, you know, prophecies. So, so I guess what would be the, a good response to that argument, SJ? It's, I, I think I would respond to that by just looking at the rewards that they got for doing that. So, so what, what happened to the gospel authors? So it wasn't, it wasn't as if these people weren't, uh, they, they weren't punished. They didn't have sex. They didn't get power. They didn't get money. A lot of them, like Paul, who wrote more than half of the books of the New Testament, Paul was, uh, I think it was 40 Jewish people in the book of Acts had taken a pledge that they weren't going to eat anything until they murdered Paul. And so they were chasing Paul around. He ends up being beheaded. You have Peter who first denied Jesus three times and suddenly he comes out and preaches for Jesus for decades because he saw the risen Jesus. And Peter ended up being probably crucified upside down. And then you had James, Jesus' brother, who wasn't really sure that Jesus was the, the son of God. He just wasn't really sure about that. Then he saw the risen Christ. And then James ended up being also martyred. And so these people were really not given any sort of reward for that. And so just to be realistic, they they didn't think that the idea that their savior is going to be crucified on a cross, they, they did not realize that that's what the passages were saying. But just to go back, Isaiah 53 says he would be pierced for our transgressions. Psalm 22 says his hands mm -hmm. and his feet are going to be pierced. Uh, Zechariah 12, 10, he, you know, the, the only one, the son is going to be pierced. And so, <laughs> you know, hundreds of years before they had even invented the crucifixion as a means of persecution, these, these uh, prophets are telling us how he was going to be killed. And Daniel and Daniel not even told us when he was going to be killed. And so, <laughs> we, so these guys can't get past that very easily. Yeah, no, they can't. <laughs> they clearly can't. Um, I'll put this one up on screen here. And I know we're touching on quite a lot. So I, I, I apologize if, uh, you know, some of this becomes redundant, but it, it, it's so important, I think, to just kind of address everything and, and even re reiterate some for uh, the audience as this gives us the best defense and even the best offense against the critics and those that want to attack the Bible. So when they say... Um, you know, that there's no mention of Isaiah or any um, Judean king from Isaiah 40 to, to 66. I mean, right off the bat, to me, this is an argument from silence, which is kind of uh, fallacious. But uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that's a good part. It's because the two parts of the book are written to tell different stories, just like the Old Testament. So the, the beginning book is more of a history and chapters 40 to 66 is more about the redemption and God's promises and what he's going to do to redeem us for our sins. And so it's just two different messages. And actually the fact that they don't name Isaiah and they don't name, Isaiah doesn't self name himself in those later books. And he also doesn't name the four kings that he had named earlier in the books. That gives us pretty good evidence that, that, uh, that he did write the whole thing because if, if he didn't write the whole thing, or, and maybe he just wrote parts of it, he would be putting his signature all around these different parts. Okay, okay I'm starting here with chapter, of, you know, this is Isaiah saying this again, this is Isaiah saying this again, but he didn't have to keep repeating that because he'd already started off that way in Isaiah 1 through 6. That's a great point. You know, I find their arguments so weak and unconvincing because as you're covering you know their best so-called challenges or criticisms um and and i'm thinking to myself you know what are their best arguments for the fact that the bible god himself is accurately predicting the, the future they're not really offering anything uh truly empirical it's just as you, you pointed out earlier um fallacious reasoning circular reasoning an obvious denial of the supernatural, an obvious denial of the super, supernatural aspects of the Bible itself. Um, and, and therefore, they in their minds, they just have to come up with something, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this this can't really be accurately prophesizing, you know, the, the future and obviously Jesus himself. Um, is, is this kind of your thoughts, too, as you've studied this specific topic way, way more than me? I mean, was there anything that jumped out at you that right off the bat was slightly convincing or? 
It's well, it's see, I started off studying Isaiah because I was studying Daniel. Daniel actually interested me to start. And and what interested me about Daniel, and this this is very it's, it's related to Isaiah because it's they go together yeah. a little bit, but Daniel was written in the sixth century BC, and he was part of the Babylonian captivity, and he was under King Nebuchadnezzar. And the very first person to ever claim that Daniel was not written during the sixth century BC was a guy called Porphyry around the third century AD and he, in his book Against Christians. And so he claimed that Daniel must have been written during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes around 165 AD, because there's no way that Daniel could have possibly known about what was gonna happen then, because Daniel foretold what happened under Antiochus Epiphanes, <laughs> which was again, the, the leader who had to be put down by Judas the Maccabean. And so it was. He was a the abomination of desolation. He was one of a, a first pieces of evidence, sort of a first fulfillment of what also is going to be fulfilled later in the end times. But Daniel prophesied that quite specifically. And so again, he did that. And then the German scholars, just like they did over here with Isaiah and with Moses, they did the exact same thing. They picked up on that and they resurrected Porphyry's ridiculous notions and decided to pretend that uh, to give that some sort of credence. And so now if you even go into Google and you Google, when was Daniel written? You're, it's going to pop up with the 165 AD because all of these atheist scholars have informed that. And so we've got evidence from Jesus. We've got evidence from others who have said that no, Daniel was written when, you know, the, he's a prophet for a reason. He was written. It's, it, it wasn't that some guy came around in the second century BC and decided to dupe the Jews and pretend he was Daniel and write this book of Daniel. <laughs> so, but Daniel, what's really cool about Daniel that people might not realize it's related to Isaiah is Daniel, uh, he, he is what they call 77s less seven. He said that the anointed one was going to be appear and was going to be cut off after the call to rebuild Jerusalem goes out. And so the estimates of the calls, they range between 539 and 444 BC. But if we go to the last two, because that's when Jerusalem, not just the temple was rebuilt, but Jerusalem was rebuilt. We've got this uh, that occurring between five, 457 and 444. So that swings us right up there to Jesus' crucifixion around 33 AD. And so that's the fascinating thing. Daniel, they, that's why one of the reasons why people during King Herod were all looking around for a Messiah, because they realized that their, their predicted times had been coming true. They realized that all of the stuff that they were seeing in the stars and the constellations, all of this kind of stuff was pointing to the Messiah being born. And so that's why there were so many fake messiahs in that first century. Amen. Another fantastic response. Um, here's a question from CJ. The synagogue, I appreciate your question, uh, CJ. He says, question for SJ. What do you think of the so-called Isaiah signet found in Jerusalem with Hezekiah's? Yeah, I, I, I kind of I kind of know a little bit about that. I don't know too much about it, but I do remember that there were two pieces of archaeological evidence found right next to each other. One with Isaiah's, uh, they call it like a little signature on the scroll, and one with Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah was a king under... Uh, so I said there was the, he was the third king that Isaiah was describing in his book, Hezekiah. He was Ahaz's son. And so Isaiah was working directly with Hezekiah and with Ahaz and with Manasseh um, until Manasseh, of course, killed him. But so Hezekiah, uh, some have actually tried to guess that Hezekiah wrote Isaiah. But I can say that to go against that for a second is the reason why you would not think that is because in book 39, Hezekiah uh, was a good king until book 39, where suddenly we find out that Hezekiah instead placed his trust in Babylon, overplacing his trust in God. And unfortunately ended up, you know, Isaiah told him, you have done the wrong thing. You're too prideful. You're too trusting in the wrong place. And because of that, your children are going to be handed over to the Babylonians. And so if Hezekiah wrote it, he wouldn't write something about himself that's so negative. <laughs> <laughs> Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, sixth seal raptor here says the New Testament shows that Jesus life and ministry is perfectly fulfilled. Isaiah 42. Amen. As well as a host of other messianic prophecies. Exactly. And, th and that's why I think this topic, this show is so important because it, it shows our brothers and sisters that even the best so-called objections, criticisms and challenges to uh, fulfilled biblical prophecy are easily answered. Yeah. 
Yeah, there, there's so many great prophecies because even in little ones that you don't think about, like Isaiah, I'm, I'm sorry, Psalm 31. I talked about Psalm 22, but Psalm 31, I sort of just discovered kind of recently. And it says how the there's um, the Savior, the Messiah is going to be uh, his, his best closest people are going to abandon him. And of course, we know that when Jesus was being crucified, the only people even witnessing it were the women and probably the apostle John. And so where was everybody else? Where was his family? Isaiah talks about him being buried with the wicked and with the rich. So he was buried by Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich Pharisee. It's like, how embarrassing. Why didn't his own family bury him or his, right. his, uh, his followers? Where were they? They were all hiding out. And Psalm 31 kind of explains that. But then, of course, Jesus appeared to them and everything changed. And we know directly from scripture, obviously, that uh, God, the, pro, the, the pro, false prophets and false gods, they can't predict the future. Mm -hmm. They're wrong on, on all accounts. And that's oftentimes how we know um, the difference between a false prophet and a real prophet and a false God and, and the real God. And mm -hmm. um, so so these critics are, are pretty well just putting the God of the Bible in with you know, the false gods that uh, the Bible tells us can't predict the future. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and that brings me again to Cyrus and this amazing prediction um, pertaining to, to Cyrus. And I know you touched on it. We touched on it a little bit. For me, that's such a fascinating prediction. I've, I've always loved that. Can you briefly reiterate why that prediction is so important and is, is so powerful? Yeah, because they specifically name Cyrus. So that's just like you're saying. A lot of times, if you even look at other other religions, you'll see sometimes there are some very vague prophecies. And some people say that our some of our prophecies that are in the Bible are somewhat vague. Now, you have to remember, God didn't want to have very specific prophecies in some cases because, of course, he didn't want to alert the devil. <laughs> the right. devil would have realized that <laughs> he's, he's all... Uh, his, you know, his his hold on everybody, his sin binding that he had was going to be freed when Jesus died for us. He probably would not have stepped into Judas and had Jesus killed. And so, so some of the stuff is somewhat vague. But the Cyrus thing is very specific. And what's interesting about that, and also evident that Isaiah was written much before, is because people who wrote around the time of King Nebuchadnezzar or even after. Uh, some of the other prophets were killed when they revealed that, say, if they said, would have said Babylon is going to fall, uh, they the king of Babylon is not going to let you survive for that. So some of the early prophets around Nebuchadnezzar's time were killed for that. And so it gives evidence that if Isaiah were writing right during the time, I mean, if Isaiah is, what's it called, his school, people were writing right during the time or just before Cyrus, the, the problem with that is that they would have faced probably uh, the, the ultimate punishment. And so... That's the big that's the big thing. So it's just more evidence again for Isaiah is the author. Amen. Amen. And and so these critics that say, you know, Isaiah is speaking directly to future generations, and therefore um there must be multiple working authors, authors that were actually in that generation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what what's a good kind of quick response to to that challenge? Well, that's just that is one way that is Isaiah is just distinctive in that some of the other prophets write for people. And instead, Isaiah is talking directly to the people who are living during the exile. And so it's it's interesting because the, the Jewish people went into exile at that time, the Babylonian exile, the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, went into exile in 586. And they also uh, Daniel had gone into exile himself around 605 B.C., and so the interesting thing about that is so we have these these Jewish exiles under Babylon and Jeremiah predicted that there would be 70 years, a 70 year lapse. And the interesting right. thing is that if you subtract out, you look at when the foundation of the, the temple was first put in the second temple in 535, that's 70 years after Daniel went into exile. And then 70 years, of course, after 586 is when the temple, the second temple was completed in 516 BC. And so there's some pretty cool stuff. And the, the Lord in the book of Isaiah, which Josephus said, Josephus is a Jewish historian who was born in the year 37, and he recounted Jewish history in a couple of books. But he talked about how Isaiah had, uh, people showed the book of Isaiah to 
Cyrus, and one of the reasons Cyrus decided to free the Jews and allow them to go you know, out of captivity and return back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple was because he saw himself. Same thing happened with Alexander the Great. The Josephus said that they showed Alexander the Great the prophecies from Daniel, and Alexander the Great ref- recognized himself in that. Mm. And so that's that was also pretty cool. That's another great response. And it's not like this is a foreign idea. Like, for example, the uh, New Testament authors are oftentimes speaking to future generations, speaking to us in the end times. Moses was was speaking to future generations. Isaiah, obviously, speaking to future generations. So, you know, that, that to me, that's a weak criticism as well. That's, um, I mean, you're doing fantastic work, SJ, because that's really all the... Um, criticisms <laughs> or challenges that uh, I've heard, ones that that I've even um, noticed through just a bit of re- research and uh, nothing convincing, all easily answered um, as, as you're kind of proving here to, today, SJ. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the cool thing about the, the Bible. The really neat thing is there's just so many different prophecies and there's so many cool things that you can look at. Your faith really gets built stronger when you read the Bible and Amen. you understand the difficulties those people went through. I, I was comparing the way that they, I mean, this is kind of weird, but I look at my son's games, Minecraft, and you see Minecraft, everyone has their little village and they go around and they try to plunder other villages and then take all the gold or whatever the resources in are in those villages. That's exactly how people lived in ancient times in the ancient Near East, which is so weird. If, if you look at it, so you'll see these, these kingdoms coming about. First, it's Assyria, and they go in there and they plunder all of these other kingdoms. They take all the wealth. The kings take the people and bring them from their place, like take the, the Israelites living in Ephraim. They take them away, cart them all the way over far east to Assyria, um, to, to these different areas. The Babylon, Babylonians did the same thing. They plunder Judah. And then they take the Jewish people and they bring them all the way over to Babylon, 900 miles away, <laughs> force them to live there. And then, and then the same thing happens in Persia. They take the people, they move them. So it's a very strange like, kind of situation of how they had to live back then. And so this idea when the Jewish people had to go into exile, they went into exile under Syria, the, the northern tribes, and then the southern tribes went into exile under Babylon. And again, that's that's something that was... The reason that, again, going back to those atheist authors, they didn't like that because in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the Lord said, if you are not good, if you people aren't obedient, you will be going into exile, living in a foreign land. And that was written, of course, way before uh, Assyria and Babylon and Persia. (laughs) (laughs) It, It really is amazing. I mean. Uh, actually, in, in Six Seal Rapture, it made a good point. The Bible always talks about past, present, and future. Most prophets were prophesying um, <clears throat> for present people and and also future. So I guess my question to you then, SJ, and, and we've kind of talked about this before in past shows as, as we kind of wind down here. Um, I guess we're already at the hour mark. Um, when a skeptic or an atheist were to say, you know, what's your reason? What's your best evidence for the Bible being divinely inspired? Would um, these amazing fulfilled predictions, these these supernatural fulfilled predictions be um, one of your top lines of evidence to look to uh, in terms of, of a skeptic? Yeah, actually, it would be. I, I, I definitely think that. I mean, I think the little things like pointing out that he's going to be pierced for our transgressions, crush for our iniquities, all that kind of stuff. He was going to make intercession for us. I, I think that that is incredible. And it, it, you know, it's, it's interesting because you can go back and you can, you can doubt all that kind of stuff and you can try to say it's not, it's not a reference to Jesus. But even Jewish people knew in the Sanhedrin 98, they knew quite clearly that there were two different types of Messiah referenced in the Old Testament. And one of the types of Messiah was a suffering servant of Isaiah 53, uh, who was going to be coming in on a donkey from Zechariah 9.9, and the other type of Messiah was going to be coming in the clouds, Daniel 7, and sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, Psalm 110. They knew there were two types. They knew that if they were disobedient, they were going to see the one on the donkey, which they did. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it's amazing how um, precise a lot of these predictions are. And I love the point you made, SJ. That really made me think where... Um, because the critics will will try and say that that some of the predictions are, are vague, right? But you pointed out that uh, that's a necessity 
in order to bring about Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for us, because for one, Satan, the -hmm. devil, if if it was too specific, then um, that which must come about, uh, it it could have, have hindered that. I guess if I'm representing your your argument accurately, I just thought that was a, a great response to, um, you know, that specific criticism. Yeah, yeah, and and we do just to throw a couple other prophecies. If you mention if it's yeah. a good argument, we know from Malachi three one that the anointed one's going to appear in the temple, and that was during the second temple period. Temples destroyed in seventy, so that gives us a date. <laughs> we know the anointed one had to come prior to seventy, and he did. So. Amen. That's amazing. There's a lot of lot of really cool fulfilled prophecies. I my I, I have to say though my best argument for the Bible is Jesus Christ Himself and how if if I, I think prophecies are great but if we just look at how He changed the world, so if you consider the way that people were pretty evil back then, you saw the way that the kings were like the Cyrus Cylinder, I am King Cyrus, I've conquered all these people, I've done all this stuff. It, it, people were admiring people who were warriors and gladiators and they were killing people and mauling them in the in the stadium in the coliseum and suddenly jesus comes around and starts talking about the meek and the poor and how the meek will inherit the world and he changed the world suddenly people realize hey we should help the poor we should help the they're not cursed by god they're blessed by god and he changed Amen. the whole message and so that little thing that that he did to change the world i think that itself is a great evident for the bible amen i completely agree and um you know, those that wanted to persecute Christians did everything in their power and everything in their ability to stop Christianity, to, to, to stop the Christians. And uh, the more persecution that came about, the more Christianity grew and, and, and grew in, in numbers. I mean, <laughs> that alone is, is, is amazing evidence for. Um, oh, yeah. And that's why I think the previous show we did on evidence for the resurrection is also such an important topic. So I want to encourage people in the audience to please check that out. That presentation and discussion uh, with myself and SJ, um, if if you haven't seen it, please check that out. Kamachi says, SJ always has good information to share. Amen. Amen. I'm just browsing through the chat and it looks like we got to all the questions. Um, Again, SJ, you're, you always come packed with information and uh, I think we left no stone unturned. I don't think this is looking too good for the, uh, <laughs> for the credit. It's, it's about time that, that they kind of just tap out. So uh, why don't I just hand it to you? If there's any uh, kind of last things, last points you want to bring up and mention, um, go, go ahead. Yeah. I, well, I just would say my last mentioning is, is if people are curious, if they really want to know is Jesus Christ Lord, did he do what he said he did? All that kind of stuff. Just go take a look at even just pick any one of the Gospels and look at who he was and don't be afraid to accept his offer. He's he's made a very generous offer to everybody for salvation. He is love incarnate. He's love in the flesh. And everything that he wants for us is for our success and for us to be with him in eternity. And he set up a beautiful eternity for us. And it's a good deal. It's not a bad deal. So no, the bad not. deal is when you you go with your own sin nature and you rebel against him, the good deal, and this is all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, the good deal is the light and the love that he has for us. So. Amen. Amen. Well said. I completely agree. Eternity is a long time. You know, time flies by here. Uh, it just feels like yesterday we had you on for evidence for the resurrection. Time really does fly, fly by in this temporal <laughs> existence of, of ours. Eternity, though, is a long time. As you put it, SJ, it's a good deal. You know, he yeah. he paid it all. Salvation's a free gift. And he's left everybody on this planet w- without excuse. We have the creation. We have these uh, amazing, fulfilled biblical prophecies. And we've seen mm-hmm. that even your greatest minds in terms of skeptics and critics, uh, even, even their counters don't work. So, you know, there's, there's no excuse. So uh, great final words, SJ, I appreciate it as well. Um, again, people are, uh, thanking you. Schneel says, thank you, uh, Dr. Thomason for your Thomason for your presentation, well, thank you. but we'll watch it later. Great information. Yes. If you're just getting here, um, please make sure to, as we end this, watch right from the beginning. Uh, SJ provided some great information and we 
uh, touched on all, all their best so-called arguments and talking points. Six Seal Raptor says, I shall upload this great stream as video to my channel to support for this subject and your channel. I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate thank you. That. You guys are the life and blood of this channel and this ministry. So again, SJ, uh, thank you so much for giving us your time for this important show. I, I know how busy you are. I really appreciate it. Uh, God bless you. And any, any quick final words before we shut it down? No, thank you so much for having me on. I hope, uh, I hope you guys will come to my channel and uh, take a look at it and all that kind of good stuff. And yeah, I like his tree too. It's got a really nice <laughs> Christmas tree behind there. <laughs> you know, I, all thanks goes to my wife. All credit goes to my wife. She set it up for me. And I thought, you know what? That's awesome. This is the sea. I love Christmas time. So, um, yeah, we, we got to take advantage of every moment. So I appreciate that, Danny. Again, I appreciate that, SJ. If you're not yet subscribed to SJ Thomason's channel, please check it out. Uh, her link is in the description box. Uh, she's putting out great content. She's doing great discussions, presentations, and lots of great interviews, SJ. So keep up the great work. I appreciate you being here. And hopefully we can do it again soon. You know, we'll, we'll talk, you and I, and, and we'll pick another important topic like this, and we'll set something up. So, SJ, God bless you. Everybody in the chat, God bless you as well. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Stand Thank you. Time.